reflect to Christ what he means to us according to the time that we spend with him. Tonight's topic, let's say it together. Why do bad things happen to good people? It's incredible the signs that we're seeing around us tonight. It hasn't been too long ago where the world was watching these men being trapped in darkness, wondering whether they were ever going to get out alive. Oh, there's so many spiritual parallels to that, my friends. Is the world trapped in darkness tonight? Absolutely. As the nation was watching these miners, so the universe is watching the Christians tonight. Then we thought about the earthquakes of the past. We'll talk more about these on a coming night. How near is the end? And my friends, this world is breaking up around us. Only when you have the faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, can we go through these times and answer the questions, why do bad things happen to good people? Back not more than 10 years ago, this was a totally different country. Why? Because we have, have had so many things happen to this country in the last 10 years, so many things happen to the world in the last 10 years, that it's almost knocking God's elect off their spiritual foundation. But we're going to discover more and more as we go through these, these signs of the times from Daniel and Revelation and the like, that you're going to discover that everything that's happening is a fulfillment of what Jesus prophesied. And then because of hanging on to that knowledge, hanging on to the ancient words of the past that has a present day application, the events that are happening around us today will fall into the, the puzzles of our minds and all come together to reflect Jesus Christ throughout the ages. My friends, this is the time that the prophets of the past have written about. This is the time that we can count as a fulfillment of the prophecies of the past. And as we see these things fulfilled, then you can be sure that the trumpet is soon to sound. And that our Jesus is coming to take his people home. What do you say? That's the hope we have. That's the promise we have when our children fall away from their relationship with Christ. That's the promise when we have that when, when we see our relatives dying of cancer. That's the promise we can hang on to when we see our relatives dying in wars on the other half of the globe. That Jesus promised he would be coming soon. And just as he promised to Christopher Columbus that there was a world to come, tonight we're going to open up the book of Daniel and see what time it's written for. There's been a lot of people in the past that have looked at prophecy and said, you know what, I see a lot of value in that. I want to study it more. You see these people in front of us. But tonight we're going to discover that Daniel, as we're going to look deep into Daniel tonight, I'll share with you why in a moment. Daniel begins not with prophecies, but with what, friends? Oh, come on. What, is it, what does it say up there? Stories. Isn't it interesting that a book that is still being discovered by most theologians, there's details in Daniel that have not been discovered. Believe me, they're opening up to God's people who are praying for the Holy Spirit, and many of which have had no theological training. Is there anybody in here? Many people are discovering things in Daniel and Revelation today that have never had any training in seminary. Why? When you have a desire for the truth, the Holy Spirit will give you the desires of your heart. So Daniel begins as Jesus gives him these concepts, and he begins with stories. Why? To teach us how to get ready to meet who? Jesus Christ. Again, the answers are on the board. I'm a great teacher, they say. But you're better students, all right? So the stories also teach us how to have, say it with me, faith and courage and what? Hope for when? Do we need hope today? Absolutely, my friends. So as powerful as the stories are, then it leads us into the understanding of prophecy. Now, tonight may seem like a, a topic without prophecy, but hang on. You will see this as a foundation as we go into tomorrow night's topic. After the stories, Jesus gives Daniel a powerful foundation for every prophecy from that time forward. Tomorrow night, don't miss it. 
the prophecies enable. What's that word? I'm losing you. Enable people to what? Prepare for the future. Do we need to prepare? How many have ever gone on vacation in the last year? Let me see your hand. Wow, that's only 5% of you. What happened to the rest of you? How many have ever gone on vacation in the last year? Oh, now more hands. You're, it's okay to admit it. You know, I know you guys are hardworking people and you don't like to admit you take it easy, but you need to take a rest. So the, these preparation times get us ready for the great climactic event of Jesus Christ coming. So that's what the prophecies are for. They are to give us wisdom. What's that word? Wisdom as to how the events taking place around us. When the news is spending all their time focusing on the negative, Jesus has given you an opportunity to open up His Word, His light, His truth, so that when the troublous times come, there is a group of people in Joshua, in Burleson, in the surrounding area, that have courage in a time of trouble. Why? Because you've studied the prophecies and Jesus said, read and understand, he that endureth to the end shall be saved. How many want to be saved tonight? Of course, absolutely. So the prophecies are important. They give us confidence that this dirty, dusty, moldy, 6,000 year old book, the principles are, are applicable for today. We can have confidence in this book. What do you say? More importantly, we can have confidence in the Holy Spirit that gave us these principles. Jesus, our Lord and Savior. How many would agree tonight? Jesus, our Lord and Savior, predicted the things that's going to happen around us. Matthew chapter 24, you see all of these what I call alarm lights. And we can see the famines that are taking place around us. We're living from one harvest to the next. We'll get into that in the coming night. But notice what Jesus said about the book we're going to look at in just a moment. He said in Matthew 24, verse 15, read it aloud together with me. I want to hear you loud and clear so they hear you on the DVDs. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by... What was his title? Let's go on. Stand in the holy place. Then he said what? Readeth what? Readeth what? That's right. Readeth the book of Daniel. So if we read the book of Daniel, it is Jesus' desire that we understand it. Would you agree? People say, Lynn, I can't understand. There's too many beasts in that thing. It will all be unfolded for you if you are faithful tonight, to, uh, faithful every night to come to the seminar and just look for Jesus. That was one lonely amen in the back. Don't look up here at me. Keep your eyes on who? Jesus Christ. He said, when you read the book of Daniel, understand it. Jesus said that we will, God's people will, this is a promise, that we will read the book of Daniel in the last days. And when we read, he will give us the ability to what? Understand it. So is that your desire? You are fulfilling the prophecy of Jesus. You are the people that Jesus says in the last day will be reading and will be understanding. Absolutely. All right, so what is the book written for? What time is it written for? Theologians are saying, oh, that was just written for the time Daniel's writing it. Friends, be careful. Theologians can't take you to heaven. Only four of you believe that. Godly theologians we need. Hello. <laughs> we do. <laughs> they lead us to Christ. Amen. Let's look at these passages very quick and let's look for the common phrase. It will tell us what time it's written for. You know it already. Let's look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Let's read it aloud together. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and. All right, we're going to look at that word seal. It's powerful. Even until the what time? Time of the end. So Jesus is telling the angel, the angel's telling Daniel, Daniel's telling us tonight that this book was only written for his time. Aha, I caught somebody because they said amen. <laughs> this book was written for what time? The time of the end. There's two phrases that sound a lot alike, but they're different. The time of the end and the end of time. 
The time of the end we are living in. The, the end of time is coming. Oh, friends, if we only knew when it's coming, we wouldn't sleep tonight. Jesus said to the angel Gabriel, the angel Gabriel tells Daniel, Daniel's telling us tonight, this book was written for our time period, the time of the end. He says, what will the time be like? Just in a brief phrase, he says, many shall be what? Do you know in your short age that you have lived, you've traveled more in the last month than three generations back did in their entire lifetime? Grab a hold of that, will you? I have to keep my mileage report. Every day I go in and chart what miles I drive for Uncle Sam and many others. And it amazes me how many miles I accumulate up as a minister of the gospel in one month. And I think, you know what, that's more miles than the average person did in their entire lifetime just three generations back. All right, so many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. We'll talk about that more. We're looking for the common phrase. The, so knowledge shall increase, and with that in mind, notice what else it says in verse 6. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, let's say it together, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? So what was Daniel's question? How long? Is it our question tonight? How long until you come, Jesus? The end of these wonders. Daniel wanted to know when the time of the end was. Daniel wanted to know when these end events would take place. So if Daniel could be alive tonight, he'd be shouting twice as loud as me because he'd be so excited that Jesus is coming soon. Look at verse 8 and 9. I heard, but I understood not. Daniel said, then I said, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up. Daniel couldn't understand them, but tonight we will because we are going to see it unfold. And sealed until the, say it aloud, living then in that time why because we are going to understand the book of daniel by the time we get finished this and you're going to be so excited verse 13 go thou thy way till the end be for thou shalt rest daniel and then you're going to stand in thy lot at the end of the days daniel's not alive tonight but my friends listen clearly his words are more alive and more fulfilled in this generation than ever before it's written for the time of the end now as we go into the book of daniel you're going to discover as you already have for some of you because you're bible students that if you break down the word daniel his mother as she named him thought of the tribe the name of God he, he tied in Jesus name and he also thought of the she also thought of the tribe of judges so his his name meant what friend God is my judge all right now listen when I don't know about you but that word judge makes me a little nervous because if you know my background when I was a teenager in early 20s it wasn't something to be proud of maybe you can't believe it now I'm in a nice suit and tie and whether you like it or not but <laughs> I didn't have such a flowery teenage years. You know, it was just, it was just something that I don't want to repeat because I want to give God glory. What do you say? So, but when I think of the judge now, it's a good thing. A godly judge means one who sets wrongs right. Remember that. If I ask you in the coming nights, what's judge mean? God is my judge. It means one who sets wrongs right. So Daniel's mom looks into the face of Daniel and says, for some reason, she said, God is going to set wrongs right in your life, Daniel. Is Jesus able to do that in your life tonight? That's what he wants to do. We're going to discover all the way through the prophecy, it's a simple principle. There's only two roads on this earth to walk. One is in Christ Jesus, and the other is in but Lynn, it seems so narrow-minded, black and white. Don't you realize the whole world is gray out there? Be careful. Jesus said, either we are gathering or we're what? Scattering. Again, whenever you repeat the words of Christ, you're not being narrow-minded. Christians should repeat the words of Christ. What do you say? 
Let's turn to Daniel chapter 1, page 878. That's why we give you the seminar Bibles, so we can all quickly move into that area. And I want you to take your pencils, be comfortable with your Bibles. Again, you're going to leave them at the table on your way out. They're going to set up two temporary tables as you go out. You just drop them there, and we have about 20 volunteers organize them so that they're alphabetized the following evening. Please use your Bible. Why? Because it makes the person sitting next to you that may be here for the first time tomorrow night feel like he's one of us. And that's what we want to create, an environment where a guest can feel part of us. What do you say? So, page 878. Daniel begins with a very powerful principle tonight of which we will see from night after night how Daniel is written for our time period. Jesus gave him the principles that are important for us. Now notice it's only two paths, good or evil. All the way through this seminar, I promise you we're going to take the complex and let the Holy Spirit break it down into something we can understand. Is that your desire? All right, that's 30%. We've got to get it warmed up. Verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, that was supposed to be God's king, came who? Nebuchadnezzar. Now watch this, two roads. So we have a king, Jehoiakim, God's king, and then we have Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon and Jerusalem, and Nebuchadnezzar besieged it. What's that mean? Conquered, that's right, overthrew it. Overthrew what land? God's people. You talk about bad things happening to who? Good people. This is what Daniel starts with. Why? If it's written for the time of the end, why does God start off by being the one that is conquered by evil? Because, friends, when the Holy Spirit pours God's grace upon your life, you are in a condition similar to God's people tonight. Are you with me? When you come and you have that encounter with Jesus, as many of you are coming to that place in your life now, not me, Lynn, I've been a Christian all my life. Watch out, the devil hears you thinking like that. And he can make you fall unless we hang on to Jesus and give him the credit. God's people were in a state of defeat. This nation, my friends, the majority of it is falling into a state of what? defeat look around us we can't win the battles we're going out to fight with the best weaponry with all the money that we're pay, uh, printing out that has nothing behind it these days another whole topic we can't win the battles unless christ instructs us and guides us through every step of the way so jesus begins this book written for the time of the end when God's people are in a state of defeat. But does that mean God is having the final word? He will through this whole story. Israel was supposed to be a symbol of what? Truth and obedience. Is God's people supposed to be that same image? Yes, of truth and obedience. Not because we have to to be saved, but because it's a result of the Holy Spirit living within us. Amen? All right, so Babylon, on the other hand, the evil, if I may, Babylon was that opposite. It was a state of confusion, error, and apostasy. Why? They had many gods. Tonight, my friends, if we look around, we don't have to look too far. You can see many gods controlling this country. One is the biggest god I can see is Hollywood. We'll go back to that another time. But friends, with this in mind, many people are asking tonight. They, they feel the grace calling them to Jesus. But they're saying, Lynn, why? My mother was a godly woman all of her life until the last five years of her life, and she struggled with cancer. It was the most miserable thing to watch her almost melt away by cancer, and yet she still held up Jesus. Why did bad things happen to my godly mother if God is so good? Is that a legitimate question here tonight? Sure it is, friends. Or someone else say, Lynn, why did my daughter, 17 years, she was in the youth group of my church, went every time the doors were open. And then she went with her friends. They were on their way to a youth group again to praise Jesus every time that she was awake, she was praising God. And yet she came down to that intersection and was hit by a drunk driver. And now she's a paraplegic. Why? Legitimate question. Daniel starts out being ripped from his homeland, out of a safe, secure zone 
where God had prepared his people to grow in the knowledge of the coming Messiah, Daniel's ripped out of that environment, walked three and a half months out through the desert sand, and then castrated like an animal. He became a eunuch of the king's quarter. I'd consider that a bad thing happening to a good person. What do you say? I don't know what's happening to you or your lives tonight. Some of you may have just been analyzed with cancer. I've been there three times. God's still in control. Some of you may have just discovered that your children are, are not communicating with you and they haven't for the last month. And you're in your mind, you're thinking, oh, something's wrong here. Every time they don't call me, something's happening in their life that isn't good. And now what are you going to do? Pray. Place them at the throne of Jesus Christ. He belongs to them. If we can trust Jesus in good times, we can certainly trust him when things go wrong. Jane Russell Rowell writes, truth, read it with me, truth forever on the scaffold, wrong forever on the throne, yet that scaffold weighs the future, but beyond the dim unknown standeth who? God, and what's he doing? Remember that, friend. Yes, Daniel was taken out of his secure zone, and before Jesus blows the trumpet, every one of you God's people tonight must come to that same condition where you have no security at all except in Christ Jesus. You say, Lynn, I'm already there. I, Christ has me in the palm of his hand. Oh, yeah? Let your retirement account fall to nothing. Let your wife or husband come down with terminal illness and die. Let your children pull away from a relationship with Christ. It will test your faith, friend. But Paul said in those moments, count it all joy. I don't know about you, but I'm not quite ready for that yet. I'll share coming events. This past 12 months has tested my faith to the max just a three-second uh, introduction to what I'll tell you more about in the future. May of this past year, riding the bike, exercising these ministerial bones and muscles, trying to remain healthy. A car out of nowhere, out in the country, I'm doing 18 mile an hour. A car doing 70 hit me in my backside. You get the idea. It's still hurting tonight. <laughs> Long story short, it tested my faith, but Jesus came through. Daniel was in his homeland, just about 17 years old, in the prime of life. He probably had his wife in his scope of his eyes, looking forward to building a family in the principles of the Messiah. And all of a sudden, an enemy was allowed to come into the courts and rip him out of his secure zone. Interesting enough, tonight you can find, if you'll go home and read Daniel chapter 1, you will find the same characteristics that we find in God's remnant called the 144,000. We'll study that on the last week together. 144,000. You find a godless king. Oh, he had gods, forgive me, but he did not have the God. Nebuchadnezzar told his army to go into Judah and find people with these characteristics now, at first, when I realized this, it caused me to be puzzled. Why or how does a king that does not know God tell his army to go out and find men who have the characteristics of the 144,000? Where does that come from? Listen, friends, I want to give you a gem of truth tonight. It will give you hope. Even those who don't know God, God communicates to them. The Bible says he pours his grace upon the entire world. So that'll give us hope when we see our enemy looking cross-eyed at us with anger in their blood. You can look back and say, I know something about you that you don't know. Jesus is working in you. 
And so Nebuchadnezzar says, find men with no blemish, well-favored, skillful in all wisdom, cunning in knowledge. You see the breakdown of what these terms mean over here on the board, those of you that like to study a bit further. They're the same characteristics of the 144,000. Understanding science, that's interesting. The science, the how, the why, the, of the science of thought. How the mind works. Why is that important? Because when you understand how the mind works, we can see Jesus in those who don't know Jesus. Thank you for that lonely voice in the back. Why is that important? Because in the coming evenings, the Bible will tell us in prophecy that God's people in the last days will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb. What's the song of Moses? On top of the mountain after they worship the golden calf, he says, Father, take my name out of the book of life, but give your people, those ones that just worship the golden calf down there, give them one more time to accept your grace. In other words, he was willing to give up his eternal life that the people at the foot of the mountain, his enemies, remember they wanted to do away with him, his enemies might have one more chance to see Jesus. The song of Moses, the song of the Lamb. Jesus, what did he say, Father? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. Understanding science, understanding how the mind works, understanding that when your enemies are angry, ready to destroy you, ready to take your retirement account, those Wall Street people out there, and run with it, remember, they may be your next-door neighbor in heaven. So don't focus on the sinner. Focus on the sin and give it to Jesus what do you say having the ability to stand in the king's palace the only way you can do that my friends is to be in Christ Jesus and the ability to learn the tongue of the Chaldeans by the way that was having an interest in prophecy oh that's right the Chaldeans they wanted to know a lot about the future and the king tells his men his soldiers as you go into Judah you're going into a place that used to be worshiping their God but now they've pulled away so much listen carefully friends tonight because it's talking about our country God forbid our country has pulled away from the foundations that we were planted on we used to be a country that was not ashamed to talk about Jesus every time there'd be a small nucleus of town uh, uh, houses calling themselves a town five or six homes there was a place that they came together every week and worshiped God now, we worship gods in our own homes. The name changes. As you look over here to my right, your left, you can see name changes is mentioned. Daniel was taken in, into, into Babylon, and as soon as they got him there, they said, okay, we've got to wash the brain. We've got to give them new identities. Listen to what the devil wants to do tonight, because this is as real today as it was in Daniel's time. How so, Lynn? The gods that are taking the place of our God is working 24-7 trying to give us new names, new characters, if I may. And what does character mean? Thoughts and feelings. About what? About everything around us, including life itself. Tonight, if you have the God of the box or the flat panel on the wall, and you spend more time with it than you spend with God, it becomes our God, and it begins washing our mind and trying to change our thoughts and feelings. Are you following me? Daniel's name in Israel meant God is my judge. As soon as he got in Babylon, the devil says, nope, we've got to take that character away from him. His new name is Belshazzar, Belteshazzar, keeper of the treasures of Baal. Same change is taking place in Hollywood. The treasures of Baal, what are they today? All oh, sin is just an alternative lifestyle. Hananiah, the Lord is gracious unto me. His new name became Shadrach, inspiration of the sun god. And when I ask you those three friends of Daniel, please don't give me their heathen names. You'll give me an ulcer. Mishael meant godlike. Babylon says, no, we'll put you close. Just, just, just close. Almost sounds like 
Meshach, servant of the goddess of Sheba. Azariah, the Lord is my helper. Abednego, the servant of Nebo. The point is, the devil only wants to change your thoughts and feelings seemingly one degree off. It's so close, Lynn. One degree doesn't matter. Watch out. If you have any medical background, and you, you take that scalpel and you're working on the heart, the thickness of a, scaffold, a scalpel off can destroy the life. Let's not try and fine-tune the truth in our image. Let's let Jesus define the truth to us. Let's let the Holy Spirit sow it in our minds according to God's will. What do you say? So you can see the name changes in the Bible, both in the Old Testament and New Testament. You remember Saul went on to be called... Paul, a great dramatic, dramatic change in his life. And so this name change of Daniel, when his name meant God is my judge to being keepers of the treasures of Baal, it's talking about our environment tonight, friend. We're struggling with the same thing. That's why Jesus begins with this remarkable story tonight. To tell us that the world, God's people... All of us on planet Earth, the devil's working double time trying to change our thoughts and feelings. It's amazing how church boards have not set in circles or time references to talk about how can we reach the world. They're talking about whether or not the pastor should be a homosexual or not. They're talking about what color paint to put on the wall, what color carpet, and then they, they fight amongst themselves. Friends, what has happened? We've taken our eyes off of Jesus. These name changes, just as they happen in Daniel's time, they're happening in our time, except for we must look through the glasses of Christ and see the spiritual application of this. Daniel is written for our time. Daniel is a man that God says, you can and will be like him. As we see the details of his life. Look at verse 2. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, Nebuchadnezzar's hand. And notice, and what else? With the what? Verse 2, come on, with the what? Part of the vessels of the house of God. Remember that. In chapter 1, we're going to see that come alive again in chapter 5. Who gave these things to a wicked king? God did. Are you uncomfortable with that? Does that make you uncomfortable tonight? God takes that which is holy and takes it from his people and puts it in the hand of the unholy. Why? Because it's part of the test of God's people. And when Christ is living in our lives, follow this tonight, when Christ is living in our lives, when God takes that which is holy or allows others to take that which is holy away from you, you're going to do one of two things. You're either going to shine and let Christ flow from your life or we're going to turn away from him. Daniel is an example of one that did not turn away from Jesus. This is when his life really began to shine. All right, so the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, said he should bring certain of the children of Israel, the king's seed and princes. These are the details, and he goes through verse 4 and tells us these characteristics. Verse 5, the king appointed them a daily portion of the king's meat. Now watch, after he gets God's men into his kingdom, follow it carefully, after he gets them into an environment that the devil can control, he begins to change what gives them life. Do you follow the principle? Look back through your own personal life and test it. I challenge you with this. I've done it with my life and it's interesting. Every time I look back and see that I left my relationship with Jesus, that which gave me life also changed. Isn't that true in your life? When I left my relationship with Jesus, I left it for four years and my life turned sour, friends. I also look back and see that that which gave me life also changed. Now, if you're a wife that's observing your husband's diet tonight, man, see, honey, I told you you shouldn't have been eating that. Don't do it. 
an individual decision individuals make between them and God. If your body is the temple of the living God, it's between you and God, no one else. Christians, if the devil can't get us away from truth, he causes us to be a critic of somebody else. Let's take our eyes off of others and turn it back to Jesus. What do you say? But Daniel was a man that stood for integrity. He knew that the king's meat and the king's wine would do him harm. So he was tested. Notice, the king began to give him things that, boy, if he wasn't in Christ, he could have said, yeah, look at this. Yeah, we might have been taken out of our homeland, but look at this. I mean, we got the king's food. They knew that there's more to life than satisfying what happens in here. God wants us to realize tonight that these images of these men are an image of America. Forgive me, I don't want to dwell on this too long, but look at the diet of America when we first established this country versus the diet of America now. We're in a pitiful condition tonight. I don't want to become legalistic and start getting into diet. Again, that's between you and Jesus. What do you say? But I think it's an important principle to remember. God said this is what would happen to God's people. So we can see. Now, friends, the important thing is here again tonight. When God allowed his sacred, holy people. Was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah his sacred, holy people? Yes or no? Yes, they were set aside for God's purpose. He allowed them to be taken into a place of which they did not choose. Notice the parallels tonight. And yet they stood for God. People tell me all the time, Lynn, I can't represent Christ. Yes, I'm a Christian, but you don't understand the workplace where I'm at. Listen, bite your tongue if you're ever tempted to say that. My wife and I were plumbers for 17 years, and and construction jobs is one of the most unholy places you could ever be in your life. Forgive me if you're a contractor. Maybe you can change your world, but I know it's difficult. God is telling us tonight, you can live the life of Daniel or Danielle in the world that you are in now. God needs you to reflect Christ's character. What do you say? Why is this important in a prophecy seminar? Because Jesus starts out with a life that was treated unfair. Is life fair? Not at all. But in the light of Christ's big picture, when you get to heaven and open up the books of heaven, by the way, we'll talk about those one whole night, you will see that in Christ's perspective, everything had a purpose. So if you get treated unfairly, Just smile your way through it because you know it's part of God's master plan and he's going to work it all out for good. These four men stand as an example of your life tonight before Jesus comes. Hello? If you're not there, you will be. God's giving us courage. Notice verse 8. And Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not what? That word defile is incredibly interesting. We'll get to that about two-thirds of the way through the seminar. It means waste away by any process. Daniel determined in his life that he was not going to create waste in his body. Now don't think about that in a physiological sense. Think about that in a spiritual sense. Everything he did, it was not about just absorbing things and making waste. It was about finding ways to represent his Messiah in an unholy place. Daniel determined, he purposed in his life, in his heart, in his thoughts and feelings, that regardless what happened in his marriage, regardless what happened in the workplace, regardless what happened between him and his co-believers in Christ, every breath he breathed, he was going to look for an opportunity of lifting up Jesus. In other words, the negative things that happened around him did not pull him away from Jesus. Do you hear the message tonight? That's why bad things happen to good people. Because those who are connected to Jesus, what's that word? Connected to who? Jesus will not let go until the end. In fact, the coming night we're going to talk about just before Jesus comes, just before he reveals himself, the righteous will be so spiritually tired. 
But God says, my people can't make it through. And before he reveals himself in the clouds of glory, he's going to give his holy people a vision of Jesus. And they will see him coming before the clouds roll back. Hallelujah. That's our Jesus. He will not let your faith die if we hang on. He'll give you enough to go through the end. So Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with these substances. May I move on? And then, well, how did he do that? Well, the Bible taught him the principles in Proverbs 4, verse 23. Let's read it together. Keep thy heart, your thoughts and feelings again, again. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the... I wish we had time to unpack this. Out of what are the issues of life? The heart. What is the heart? Your thoughts and feelings. Friends, your attitude begins in your thoughts. Chew on that a second. Having a bad day? Your attitude begins in your thoughts. For as he thinketh, do you see that? As you allow your thoughts to go into areas they shouldn't go, in his heart, so is he. Friends, you can mark it down. If you climb out of bed thinking, oh, my wife made me make the bed again. Some of you can't relate to that. <laughs> You're going to start your whole day off wrong. If you get up and say, hallelujah, i got one more day to live in Christ, you'll have a good day. We're not animals. Anybody agree? True story. I worked at Fort Detrick, Frederick, Maryland, where they did a lot of research on animals and cancer research. And one of the large buildings, eight-story high buildings that had a big, what they call an eight ball in it, where they'd put animals in. It was a three-story high test laboratory where they'd push animals in there in cages and, and let off germ warfare bombs and watch the effect as it had on the animals. I'm still doing that, by the way. But anyhow, I was there working, and one time the building caught on fire by a construction crew and it burnt down. Well, they had to move these apes out in large cages and rush them off to another building. And they're going down the road, and apes make a terrible noise when you change their daily routine. You can't relate? Well, they say we're a lot like apes. We make a terrible noise when our routine is changed. But anyway, they were doing an experiment on ape one time, and, and they wanted to know the connection between the desire for pleasure versus the desire for the things we need to sustain life. Are you catching the picture? How great was the desire for pleasure in the mind of an ape versus the desire for the food and the natural things that we need to continue living? So, because entertainment's taking a lot of our time in the United States, and they wanted to do this study, and, and by the way, it was quite popular what they found. But anyway, they put this ape to sleep. They found the part of the ape's brain that was electrified, and, and they put the ape to sleep, and they put a receiver inside of his skull with the electrical probe going down into the area of the brain that's stimulated when he's having an exciting moment, when he's being entertained. Are you following? That's 30% of you. And then they sewed the ape back up again, and the ape recovered very quickly. Now, as soon as the ape recovered, he pu they put him back in his cage, and they, the trainer came in, and mounted this big red button on the corner right inside the door into the room where his cage was. Now, anytime the trainer came around, the big ape was always watching the trainer because he knew the trainer was there to either give him food or to have fun with him in a test or something. So the, the ape was very curious. They were buddies, and he was watching the trainer as he walked in, mounted this red button up on the wall. And the ape's curiously looking, just sitting there watching the trainer. And then the, uh, the trainer came over and talked with the ape a little bit, and then went back over, and the ape's watching him again, and the ape just sitting there watching, and all of a sudden the trainer hit the red button. Now when he hit this red button, the transmitter sent a signal to the receiver that was where? In the brain of the ape. All of a sudden, for some unknown reason, the ape began to feel so excited and he started making those noises that apes make I can't imitate it and began climbing over the trees and getting excited about life he didn't know why but he was just filled with euphoria and as he calmed down about 15 20 minutes later the trainer knew it was working 
And the trainer come back in and did what? Hit the red button. What, what happened? The ape felt good about it. We didn't have to do that too many times. Apes learn very quickly. And the ape put a connection between the way he was feeling and the what? The red button. So the trainer said, aha, he's hooked. Now let's move it from the wall over onto the side of the cage. What do you think the ape did? See, we think like apes, don't we? What did he do? <laughs> Hit the red button. Sure enough. Oh, the ape now had his key to happiness. Are you following me tonight? So sure enough, the ape hit the red button, and he was just flying all over the cage. It was like an instant fix to all problems of life. Every time he felt down, he went over and hit that red button. He was hooked on the what? Red button. That's right, hooked on the feeling, like the song says. <laughs> all right, the ape trainer says, okay, now he's getting the picture. Now let's see how powerful the desire for entertainment, are you following me? The de desire for entertainment, the desire for good feelings, the desire for all the entertainment of life, how powerful that is over the needs to sustain life. And so there was one thing they knew the male ape loved, and that was his girlfriend. And they didn't bring the two together unless they wanted to procreate. So sure enough, while the ape's hooked on that red button, he's going over hitting it about every 10, 15 minutes, they wheel his girlfriend in in a cage just beside of his cage. Normally when that happened, the male ape came down and he barely got him three feet away and he was putting his arm through there, hello, how you doing, and making friends. You know you know how the male ape and the female, well, maybe not. But anyway, they were really trying to get to know each other and making their affections known to each other. Well, this time, what do you think the male ape did? That's right, I heard you men re responding. You know what it's about. Hit the red button. He wasn't interested in the lady. Why? Because this was instant entertainment instant pleasure and the lady you had to work for it it's a rough crowd here tonight <laughs> so the trainer knew that this was really going to be worth recording and telling others so he began taking diligent notes and he finally saw that the male ape just knew the difference between the entertainment or the pleasures of life that you have to work for and those that are right there just at the tap of your finger, the, the red button. So he says, okay, let's see how strong. So he took the lady out. What do you recall, female ape? But anyway, they took her out and took her and put her inside the cage with him. And she goes over. And where was the male ape at? Sure, that's right. You can almost picture it, can't you? And... and the female ape come around and went right in there. Oh. And she began rubbing up and down his leg. And what do you think he did? Oh. That's right. The front group already can relate. Get away from me. I already have my, my fix here. And she's going, oh, come on. And so they saw that he was hooked on the red button. And so they took the depressed female ape out, put her in a cage, took her out. And there's only one thing a male ape loves more than the lady. What is it? Some of you remember from two years ago. Maybe that you've been watching apes lately. They brought in a big tray of unspotted fruit. What kind of fruit? What, what do you feed apes? Bananas, apples, mangoes. Yeah. So they brought him in there on a tray and set it right down at his feet. What do you think he did? No, he didn't. He didn't eat. One day, two days, three days went by. All he did was hit the red button. Until true story, two weeks later, that ape fell down dead with a fresh tray of food at his feet. Died of starvation because he was hooked on the red button. Hold on to your seat. You want the truth? three of you we mailed out 60,000 brochures for this meeting tonight you are the folks that came out what's wrong with the world they're hooked on the red button it's too easy to hit the red button at home and 
listen to some prophecy like this. It's too easy to hit the red button at home and worship other gods. It's too easy to go find whatever you want in your home. The world is hooked on entertainment. In fact, it's the largest industry in the United States now. We are very vulnerable. They're paying more to producers to come up with new shows that keep the hook, the world hooked on the red button. In fact, it's spread from our country to the entire world. I've gone to Africa, into the, the distant, remote villages of Africa, and I'll go in and stay in a hotel and go in, and, and the big dining room of the hotel, what do you think they're showing? American programs, and it makes me ill. Because all the Africans are sitting there spellbound, even though they can't hardly understand English. They're spellbound because Hollywood is their God. The wine of the wrath of her fornication. Those of you who have been studying Revelation. The world is hooked on the red button while Jesus is about to come. Jesus needs you to be a shining ember, just as he needed Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Friends, your life has an identity. Your life has a purpose. Your life has a mission. Grab a hold and let's go and have fun for the Lord. What do you say? Tonight, Jesus says, you're not just another person in this area. You're not just another person in your community. Your life is important. I don't care whether you got fired today. Your life is very important. In the hands of Jesus. Daniel chapter 1 tells us how to fulfill God's will and to receive the blessing. How do we get the blessings of God? Number one, you determine to do what? Is that your purpose in life? Do we love Jesus so much we get up in the morning, Lord, how can I serve you today? You allow him to take away the what? Obstacles. You know what it feels like to walk with a pebble in your shoe? Get it out. Don't try and just keep walking. It hinders your life. What are the obstacles in life? That which has become our gods. Let God have them. All the way through the Old Testament, my friends, whenever God was calling his people to come into a revival, a reformation, he said, give me your gods. Give them to me. Why? God doesn't want us to have all the, di- the wonderful things of this world. No, that's not it. He says, I want you to rise above the rest around you so that you can reflect Christ. Are you with me tonight? Daniel's life was an example of that. He went through a difficult time, walked three and a half months, castrated like an animal. But what did he do? God tested him, and within a very short time, God said in chapter 1, he became ten times wiser than the wise men. There's coming a time, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I don't care what church you're part of tonight, I believe you're God's family because you responded to the Holy Spirit. There's coming a time when you will be tested against your will, as Daniel was. And if you truly keep your eyes on Christ through the test, you will be amazed at the test results. Christ said... That those who took tests in the past and failed them like I did in my 12th grade of high school will shine bright and get straight A's in the kingdom of God. Let God take the obstacles away out of your life and then dedicate your life work to Jesus Christ. Give Him what's left of your life. What do you say? You will have more fun than you can imagine. As I said, my wife and I were plumbers for 17 years and then one morning, 3.30 in the morning, the Lord woke me up and said, Lynn, I've given you the desires of your heart. Give them back to me. We had a beautiful house sitting up on the side of the mountain on, in Maryland and, and had five-car garage, two-person jacuzzi in our bedroom. We thought we had everything because my wife came from a family of eight in a little town called Jugtown that made moonshine for the president. That'll give you something to think about on the way home. But and then I came from a little town called Pondsville, about a mile away. We were from poor families, eight children in both families. God says, I'll give you the desire of your heart. So I claimed that promise at 17 when he called me to do the ministry, and I said, no, God, I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. I had a whole list of things. As a poor boy, wanted everything. He gave me the desires of his, my heart 17 years later, which meant I was how old? 34, thank you. 
He said, now I've given you the list that you asked for. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, give it back to me. I woke my wife up, and I'll tell you the rest of the story later. The point is, at 34, I gave my life to the Lord as he wanted me to do when I was 17. And friend, from that moment on, as I look back, you'll read that book of life in heaven, and you'll see the most exciting times of my life, of Peggy's life, was from that time when everything we do is to glorify God. That was when life began. This experience in this town, as, as the, we began this meeting tonight, I just had to, in fact, if you ask the volunteers, I said, how did I get in this place where I can serve God? Only by God's grace. How did you get to this point where you hear God's voice and you respond to it? Only by God's grace. My friends, if you could see the value of your life in heaven tonight, you are equal in the mind of Christ to Daniel tonight. Your life is very important. Daniel was a man after God's own heart. He loved God. He says, regardless what happens to me, I am going to stand for Jesus. Verse 16, thus Melzar took away the portion of the king's meat and the wine and they, that they should drink and gave them pulse. Vegetables, you talk about a, a, a real difficult time. They went from all the king's meat to vegetables. But yet Daniel knew the value of what goes in here happens up here. Verse 17, as for these four children, God gave them what? Gave them what? Knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. How many would love to have that ability tonight? Let me see your hands. Come on. To understand everything that you, you've been told. Absolutely. That's what God's people's desire should be. To understand God's word where it transforms our life, gives us hope in a difficult time, helps us to help others to find answers when they're in the most difficult time. Friends, that's what God has your purpose of your life here tonight. That you will have the answers and wonder where they came from and then realize they were from God. That's what your life has been brought here today for. You know the value of what God gives you. Amen? God says in verse 20, And in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them what? Ten times better than all the magicians, astrologers that were in his realm. So Daniel was found ten times wiser than the then known wise men. Tomorrow night we'll discover who those wise men were. Sit there in the holiness a moment for a, mo for a second and think about this. When you get into clouds of glory with your beloved redeeming Savior, and you see what your life was worth at this moment, you will find that your life was found ten times better than the wisest of the earthly wise men tonight. Why? Because you know what is valuable in God's Word. And you respond to it because you hear the voice of Jesus when He calls you to truth. Are you with me tonight? Don't count these decisions to come to this meeting. Light decisions. They are the most important thing you can do. Not because you're coming to me. You're coming to Jesus and His truth night after night. And I promise you, you will leave this seminar feeling, wow, was that valuable time. God has you here for a purpose because very soon this world is going to crumble around us. Have you been listening to the news lately? They're about ready to go into another country, into a third war. Friends, this world is about to hit the most insecure time that it's ever seen. And yet, that is going to be prime time for God's people. Because that is the time where your faith will not weaken. This will be the time that God has created you for. Your neighbors will come to your house and say, Please, can you tell me what the news means tonight? And you're going to open up the Holy Scriptures. You're going to say, Watch, this same time period Daniel went through, and he went through to the end. So will you in the grace of Christ. The things of this world, my friends, are crumbling around us. We've seen many examples of that. They're the early labor pains, if I can say it that way, for the mothers that have had children and know what I'm talking about. The coming events are going to be predictable very soon. Jesus did not plan on this happening, but He knew it would happen. 
So he placed you in the community you live in. He gave you the wisdom to hear his voice calling you tonight. How do I know that? Acts 17, 26. He said when he created Adam, he created your life in Adam. He created the time you would be born. He created the place where you would live. Acts 17, 26. Look at it carefully. You don't like the house you're living in? Talk to Jesus. He put you there. Why? Because your neighbor next door to you is waiting on you to tell him about Jesus. God originally planned on us being in the Garden of Eden, but guess what? He's going to have us there pretty soon. Hello? He will, my friends. He's got a mansion. He's going to put these Texas mansions to shame. Why do bad things happen to good people? To reveal who we really rely on for our security. If you're looking to your boss to give you happiness, you got your eyes in the wrong place. If you're looking to your Mercedes to give you a good ride, you got your eyes in the wrong place. If you're looking for the things that you can buy for your home, your Texas home, you've got your eyes on the wrong place. If you're looking to your mate to give you happiness, you've got your eyes in the wrong place. I thought I'd really hear an amen on that. Your security, my friends, is only in Christ Jesus. He also is allowing us to go through these challenging times to create what? Patience in the hearts of the redeemed and to help us to get to know God even better and to understand that it's ultimately the devil who causes pain. God's ultimately going to give us what? Pleasure. That's the reward of the righteous. And we don't even know what that word pleasure means until we get there. God has some awesome, rich blessings for you. Do you believe it? Tonight, as we close in a song, I want to promise you that what you're going to learn in the rest of this seminar is going to change your life. You're going to mark your life and refer back to this seminar from this day forward. I've seen it in every town because the Holy Spirit never lets us down. What do you say? Bring a friend tomorrow night. God bless you as we look forward to seeing you tomorrow evening. Continue tossing me on the storm, I'll call his name for relief from things distressing me. Now, so quietly it comes, strength to fall. Again, though he does so much for me, the sweetest gift will always be peace in the midst of. In the midst of the storm, I cry to him for mercy and his great love. Take Sadness coming day by day, but I will not be afraid, for I 
of the storm in God's peace in the midst of the storm I regardless what's happening to you tonight remember he says I will never leave you nor forsake you how many believe that tonight hallelujah heavenly father we thank you for your blessed hope that when Daniel was taken out of the comfort zone into a place called Babylon into the most discouraging depressed place that he could imagine and tested he was found ten times Lord, we can't look at ourselves and see that test coming. But we can look at Jesus and see the test results. Help us to leave this place tonight with Christ in our thoughts and feelings. That when we come back tomorrow evening, we can tell the world what Jesus means to us tonight. Thank you for this hope, but thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Keep them safe until we come back tomorrow night, we pray in Jesus' name.